Well, um, when I first told my mom I wanted to go down to the South Pole a couple of years ago, she, uh, I, she had, she was skeptical, I think. But, um, I think once it all got set in motion, um, I think my mom was pretty excited about it. Uh, when I first started to prepare <clears throat> to come to Antarctica, I was just beside myself because I knew so little about Antarctica or, or even what my purpose would be. It was just kind of one of those things. It was a, a place that I wanted to go and I was willing to do mostly anything to get there. But Antarctica is like no other place you've ever been. In pursuit and support of scientific research, you'll face challenges unlike any. It, my mind was just a big, I mean, it was, I, I knew it was a big open space. I knew it was cold. I, all I had was the images that I got off of that documentary, you know, this lone station sitting in this, this vast whiteness and uh, extreme cold, cold that I couldn't even relate to. I was curious how I'd deal with the cold. It was mostly just an adventure. It wasn't. I didn't see it as a as a huge daunting challenge. It was. It was exciting. Wow! Nice bloom off the of My father is is classic in that. In one breath, he'll grumble about how this isn't going to get me into any sort of legitimate career, and in the same breath, he'll brag that I'm going to the South Pole. My boss, up until up until. Like the week I was leaving, he kept being like, sure you're gonna go? He's like, come on, he's like, you're not going out there, you should just stay, like, you know, trying to get me to stay in my job. It's a magnificent thing to, to try to get ready for something that you have no idea how to prepare for. I'm kind of a neurotic packer, and not knowing what to expect was hard. I, the biggest thing that I was, I, I, I think the, the dominant force was packing light. I mean, I was obsessed with packing light. I, they, whoever my contact was, it just made it sound like every ounce counted. I felt like a you know, a Pacific Crest Trail or AT backpacker. I was about ready to chop off my toothbrush handle. I had mixed feelings when I found out I got the job because I wanted it, but then I'm like, I don't know. And um, probably the biggest complication was that my sister um, got engaged last spring, which meant that I might be missing her wedding. She said she was going to disown me as a sister if I didn't make it to the wedding and like this and that. And luckily it all worked out. I made it to the wedding. A lot of people were trying to cram in their last minute electrical work, you know, their little electrical projects to, you know, get me to deal with. Well, do you have time? We don't want to, you know, uh, rush you, you know, we know you're getting ready to get up out of here, but do you have time? Do you think you can look at you? So it was a lot of that stuff going on too. Yeah. I stepped off the plane and I got the classic frozen nostril sting, um, but it was much sharper than I'd ever experienced before or since. I don't, I don't know if this was in the first five minutes, but soon after I got here, I became convinced that it was crazy to be here. That human beings never should have come to the South Pole, and like, um, it was bad because it was so cold and 
really like that. That was kind of my reaction. I stepped off the plane with this like kind of expectation, like this gung ho thing, and, and within a second, my sunglasses covered over. With it was just fogged over, so I took them off, and then there's this blazing white light, and there's like hot, bright light, bright light, and then you feel the cold. You know, it's negative 55 or something. We had to walk from the plane to the polar station, and I was struggling because we had these bags loaded down, and 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 I remember going up the stairs into the station, and I had my my uh, duffel bag across my shoulder and I was just so exhausted from just a walk from the plane and I felt myself falling backwards and I and someone put their hand out and tried to you know to straighten me out. <laughs> Well, this is the uh, B3 pod. All the offices are in this pod. What are you guys doing? Uh, we're drywalling. It's like we're drywalling the thing four times over. In other words, he doesn't Because there's uh, two sheets on each side of the wall. I live and work in Durango, Colorado, and I work on steam locomotives on the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad. Most recently I was living in Burlington, Vermont, and I was working, um, I was commuting um, every week over to the Adirondacks, Saranac Lake, right near Lake Placid. Well, we're just finishing all the signs up for B1 birthing. I was doing wilderness therapy, so I was taking a Hoods in the Woods, um, really rich, wealthy kids with problems into the woods to try to cure them. But uh, it was great. Yeah, I was a journeyman wireman. I'm an electrician in the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, 24 years, local 1579, Augusta, Georgia. But Augusta, Georgia is not my home. I reside in Riverside, California. For the last few years in the off season, I've been working um, counting sea lions in Alaska and um, just kind of fighting it out in a moldy tent for a few months. Well, I certainly didn't have a problem with the altitude much. I mean, you know, I was a little winded the first day, but that wasn't a problem. Uh, the cold was the biggest adaptation. I'd grown up in Southern California, so, you know, a frosty morning was, was cold. People from the United States in general tend to have this Henry Ford, like 40 hours a week, weekends off, 50, screen, 50 inch screen TV, kind of like, ch -ch -ch. and and this isn't this isn't the United States. This isn't uh, your average job. So true. Antiguamente, el vino era hecho en casa de adobe.
Eh, la señora Dina, en esa época, ella era la que hacía el vino. Tenía muchos secretos. Uno de los más importantes era que la uva la pisoteaba con los pies embarrados, sucios. Y eso le daba una fermentación muy exquisita al vino. Se corrió la voz en todo Chile de que la señora Dina tenía un excelente vino. I want you to take a look at that first to see if you could actually turn around in there. Because we only have a certain part that's groomed. Historia del diablo. Puso un letrero grande en la entrada de la casa de Adobe, así circular. Que decía: No entre, el diablo está dentro. Luego esta señora Tina, antes de morir, le contó el secreto que estoy contando yo a su hermana. Eh, en la etapa ya de agonizando dijo no quiero asustar más a la gente tal de algo adentro y le dijo a Tonka Tonka por favor ponle al vino casi lleno del diablo se ha venido reencarnando y en este momento en la corazón tenemos la reencarnación del diablo que se murió tres años The Chilean expedition to great science and to a safe journey back to Patriot Hills. And it's great to meet and see everyone. That's right. Salute. How much fuel uh, do we use here in the average season? In the summer, it's about 380,000 gallons. It depends a little bit on population and stuff like that, but that's what we're sort of planning on usage this year. That works out to about 16,000 gallons a week, roughly. In the winter, it's just slightly less than that. It's about 366,000 gallons. It comes in the tanker and it's um, surprisingly cheap. Uh, when we buy it in McMurdo. Last year it was about $1.31 a gallon that's in McMurdo. This year it'll probably be more. But uh, by the time it gets here you have to add about $15 a gallon for, for shipping. Generally we get about half the flights as tankers. It depends. Every, every plane brings um, 26,000 pounds or 27,000 pounds of cargo and that can be fuel or it can be boxes, it can be steel, it can be anything. Um, this year we've got 326 flights planned, and of those, about 170 are, are fuel flights. Right now there's 45 10,000 gallon steel tanks. Um, they're in tiers. They've got containment boats underneath them. Um, before we had the tanks, just a few years ago, there was nine 25,000 gallon bladders in there. Um, it was much more spacious and much less industrial looking. It's the only way of really confirming the volume of fuel. We dip every tank on station once a month, and the active tanks we dip daily. Um, and you know we can go with meters and what planes give us and what usage is. But the only reason to really, or way to really confirm what we've got on hand is to get up on top and look inside of them. Low fuel here. <laughs> okay. Just like any place, you get a mix, but the, the overall sense I get is a lot of people are just, oh, yeah. I got you. they're people who function better outside the system, they lead slightly to very alternative lifestyles, um, that may carry over into, re, into their relationships Great. with family, with significant others, their approach to life. I mean, there's people who haven't been back to the States in years. I think the people that are drawn to the pole are adventurous in nature, very outgoing. I think I'm a bit introverted, 
you know, to an extent, but I, I, I'm not much of an introvert. I couldn't be and be here. I don't think so. But I, I think I, I think I am a little bit. Let's get the shack alone. Most of the people here are kind of can-do people, and it's kind of nice because they're people that. A lot of times I get stereotyped as a person that can't settle down, but I, I think it's the opposite. I think it's a person that, that realizes that they don't need to settle down, that, that you can have a good life. And I think that's the beauty of, of the Antarctic and of the South Pole. It trims very much of the fat of the community, of, the, of society. I think first and foremost, and no matter what, this is still a huge factor. I think a lot of people are drawn here by the community, um, which I think the same goes for myself. Um, I feel, I probably feel a lot more content and just at peace being in one place. You have very little um, daily choices, worries, you know, because most things are covered for you. And I also think that money is a factor and there's a limit to how much you can spend here. And knowing that you're saving all that money is huge. And um, and even if you're making a little less than you make in the States, I think that's why some people come. Um, I think obviously, I think most people who come in here probably um, have a, a thirst for adventure, that would be my guess. The underlying principle that binds folks together, I guess it's just, uh, it's just this kind of camaraderie, this, this ability to kind of make your dreams come true because <clears throat> you don't there are so many people that I know that are absolutely turned off by the idea of just of going places and, and it seems that people have such a hard time just getting out their front door. Hold on, Rob. More and more as I'm here I feel like I'm kind of a I feel like I'm kind of in not in a dream. Like I'm very, very much here, but the rest of the world is kind of fading. Like I don't know if you ever feel that way. And not that it's fading. Not that, not that I don't think about those people. I think about them a lot, and I actually, pretty, I've been pretty good about keeping in contact. But it's like, this is just totally different. It could be on Mars, you know. Like it's, it's really weird. And then there's just I think regular Joes who, it's a one-time adventure. You know, it's it's a way to make some money. It's a way to see someplace different. Um, there's definitely a handful of those people in the mix too, but I, you, you, you just get a people of a certain kind of march to their beat of a different drummer, their own drummer type. I was really overwhelmed about of uh, how amazing the people were when I first arrived, just because they're, they're they have so much to offer and they've had so many great experiences and they have this wonderful outlook on life. And it's really difficult to find that group of people in the same place um, as easily as I've found it here. Uh, the short answer is from down there. And uh, down there is what we call our rod well. Rod being short for the name Rodriguez, which is the name of the guy who engineered and designed the rod well, so it's the Rodriguez well. It's about 440 some odd feet to the bottom of the rod well right now. Um, and these two lines go up to the reel, the hose reel, and if well water comes out through this, uh, you have a, a big, a big opening down there. It's a it's a great big bulb, what they call. And it kind of got a shape like this, they think. And you start it by putting a hot point drill down there, which is just basically a giant heating element which creates that shaft that you see. You go so far down and then you start uh, putting hot water down there with a hot water pump that we have. And it cycles hot water through that comes from our water supply in the new power plant. It comes out here. Uh, jets it into, into the hole, makes it bigger and bigger and bigger, creating the bulb, and sucks the water back out, sending it back to the power plant. 
place affords you opportunities to be creative and challenged and also just lead kind of a wacky life in a lot of ways. Believe it or not, for as cold as it is here, I think it's, I think it's a warmth I feel here uh, that emanates from the people. What I want to do is uh, carve two faces on the inside, one on this side and one on that side. So the only way you can see them is with a mirror. We've got a little beach scene going. Okay. We'll see how it turns out. We'll see if it turns out that way. Okay. You're my bumper, I got one tail light in. I thought it would be best to drop plans on graph paper ahead of time. I won't admit what it is until I get uh, further along because it may change part way through the process. A vision? Yes. We want to have the sexiest shoe in the all of South Pole. <laughs> I mean, you need your ECW wear for survival, but you, you need this for warmth too, as well, a physical warmth, but this it's this mental warmth that you require too in order to survive. I don't think you can survive without it. Polar friendships are some of the best I've had just because they are so rich, they happen so quickly because you have this kind of allotted amount of time and the beauty of the Antarctic is you have time to have a friendship. Everywhere else in the world you're commuting or grocery shopping or doing this and doing that and here you have to live and work and recreate with one or two or three people that you've kind of chosen to spend your time around and it just it helps these uh, friendships flourish. I think polar friendships do survive. I think because of the type of people that are down here, often our lives are going in wildly different directions. And the friendship survives in that if I see you year after year on the ice, we're, we're friends. Every time we see each other, we instantly reconnect. The friendship continues. I think they have the potential to last, but like any other friendship, you have to work at it. It's no different, you know. Just given the environment, it's still it's still a work in progress. You have to work at it. Antarctica, as a land of mystery and intrigue, has been dominant in the world's imagination for centuries. Since the era of the ancient Greeks, it has been preserved in word and thought. They named this mysterious other world Antarctos, which translates to opposite of Arctic. They could easily conceive of the northern Arctic regions, but the southern part of the planet, this region of eternal fire, this place overwhelming with monstrosities, was forbidden to their minds. Captain James Cook, in 1773, began the European discovery phase when he completed the southernmost circumnavigation of the globe by crossing the Antarctic Circle twice. He was prevented southern passage by walls of impenetrable ice, but voyaged as far as 71 degrees 10 south. Fabian Gottlieb van Bellinghausen, who idolized Cook, made the first land sighting in 1820. He initially thought it was merely ice he had sighted. His ship, the Vostok, was equipped with several morale-boosting devices, such as a sauna created by heating cannonballs and placing them beneath a tent. James Waddell, an adventurous sailor in search of seals, on two separate voyages transgressed to 74 degrees 15 south. In 1840, the French explorer Dumont d'Urville followed Waddell, and although plagued with sick and dying men, made contributions of knowledge, as well as the first landing on the continent. His voyage lasted over three years. A greater achievement was performed by the Arctic veteran Sir James Clark Ross, who penetrated the ice pack and reached the Ross Sea. He aptly named Mounts Erebus and Terror for his vessels. The Belgian adventurer Adrian de Gerlache, sailing in the Belgica, became entrapped in ice and remained so for 377 days. To break free, a channel had to be cut to the open water. Roald Amundsen was the first mate on this journey, but one Frederick Cook, ship surgeon and gentleman of notable charisma, greatly aided in this remarkable feat of survival. 1902 brought Robert Falcon Scott southward. Sailing in the Discovery, along with Shackleton and Royds as officers, they went afield, intent on performing a magnetic survey. 